Thanks, everybody. Welcome to Build. I'm your host, Ricky Camilleri. And surprise, surprise, one of the best upcoming shows on television is co-created by Ryan Murphy. But seriously, FX's Pose is a wonderfully crafted, beautiful, and meticulous show, especially in its recreation of New York in the 1980s. One of its writers and directors, Janet Mock, has been an LGBTQ advocate for years, and she is a perfect match for the show. Let's take a look. Everything is over. High fashion evening wear. Ladies of luxury, why are you in a nightgown? A lady do need beating for a formal fashion affair. It's chiffon. <laughs> Come now. It's a Halston. Halston? For J.C. Penny? Please welcome Janet Ma. Uh, thanks for having me. <laughs> Even I lose track mid conversation. Janet Ma, sorry. Uh, Janet, thanks so much for being here. Of course. Congratulations for on me. Pose. Mm. I was just telling you. I probably could have waited to tell you, but I wanted to gush. I love it so much. I Good. I love this show. Mm, um, I do too. <laughs> you don't just do a wonderful job. It's it's over the top great. It's beautiful. It's funny. It's emotional. It teaches lesson lessons without being preachy, and it's perfect for, I don't know, not just right now, it should have been perfect 10 years ago. And I think as a fan of Paris is Burning as well, it's just like, a lot of it's like candy for me. I, I love it. Congratulations. Thank you so much, Ricky. It's so, it's so, it's such an honor to be a part of it. Let's talk about how you, you had an, an ascent really in its first <laughs> season in terms of behind the scenes. So let's talk, talk about how you started on it. How did mm -hmm. this start for you? So I got a call in July that, um, Ryan Murphy wanted a meeting with me, and of course I was a fan of, of Glee and American Horror Story um, in The Normal Heart, and so I just was floored. I jumped on a plane, I went to Hollywood, and he was directing the pilot for um, the assassination of Gianni Versace for his anthology, American Crime Story, and um, he told me about Pose. He said it was a series, a scripted series about 1980s New York City centering on um, five women in the, um, five trans women in the house ballroom scene, which is largely, as you mentioned, um, depicted in Paris is Burning, the 1990 um, documentary by Jenny Livingston. Um, What's so interesting is the trailer for the show, I remember the initial teasers for the show were made to look like Paris mm -hmm. is Burning, and I was like, oh, they're really going for it. They're <laughs> just going to do Paris is Burning. But they didn't, but you had no, did no, not. No, 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 I know. And I think that was a largely a, um, a, deci a smart decision by the, um, the marketing department at FX, which is stellar. Um, they knew that the only way in which most people know the house ballroom scene is through Paris is Burning, and so they thought, why don't we make it look as if our characters are out on the New York City streets being interviewed like a documentary. And so a lot of my own friends were confused. They're like, are you doing a reality show? And I was like, no, 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 it's a scripted series. Um, if there was a reality show about the ball scene in New York City, I would watch that. There is, there's one on oh, Viceland. Yeah, it's called oh. My House. Mm -hmm. well, thank you so yeah. much. I will go watch that. <laughs> <laughs> it's about the Kiki scene today. Um, but yeah, so he invited me to be a part of the writer's room. He knew very early on that he wasn't maybe the most ideal person to tell this story as a um, white cisgender um, gay man. But he loved this community and he wanted this community to have not only um, representation on the screen, but also behind the scenes. And so when I joined the writer's room, I didn't know that it was historic. I didn't know that I was going to be the first trans woman of color to write for a major television series. Wow. But I did. And so then during the pilot um, shoot here in New York City, we shoot in New York. Um, it's a period piece, so we bring in the cars, we bring in, you know, we de-strip the glam of New York now and we kind of bring it back to its grit. And so this show, um, during the pilot, I was promoted by Ryan to producer, and then he told me in March that I'd be directing episode six. Now, two years ago, mm. did you ever imagine or fantasize about directing scripted television? Was that on your radar? It was not. 
I just wanted to write for television. I knew that. I knew I had my own ideas about scripted series that I wanted centered around um, trans women and trans girls like myself. Um, and so to be able to be a part of a show that's heavily funded and resourced and shepherded through someone like Ryan um, was just, it was like, this is the perfect graduate school for me. You know, this is my film school. A very quick graduate yes, school. Yes, very quick. Like too. Very quick. Like July to, you mm -hmm. started, you had your meeting in July. I was and then hired when in were August. you directing by? I was directing in May. I just wrapped last week. You just Tuesday. wrapped last week. Mm -hmm. Okay. We'll yeah. talk more about the whole ascent <laughs> and what it felt like, but what, how did you like directing? I love directing. I just realized it was another tool um, to be able to tell stories. I think that a director's job is to communicate their vision based on telling the story of the script. Um, I thought initially that I would need to know so much about um, technical stuff, that I, but I was like, oh no, I don't need to know that because everyone here um, is, you know, are, are masters at what they do. Our DP, Simon Dennis, he knows what he's doing in terms of lighting. Um, he I has like a kind of established yeah, look he established of the show a look a little for bit, the show. Yeah. And so I just had to slide right in and just say, what do I want to see and how, what is the move that we want to tell for this particular story in this particular scene? And so for me, once I broke it down to just that, um, it made it more accessible. But Ryan also, because of the half initiative where he made the dedication to ensure that he gave um, female storytellers, minority minority storytellers, folk of color, and LGBT folk um, resources to be able to step into this space, that he got me into the DGA, that he got, he allowed me to shadow another um, wonderful female director, Gwyneth Horder Payton, on episode four. Um, and she was also there at my side as I was directing, kind of acting as my first AD. And so I was well taken care of to the point that I felt as if like I could take some risks and I could do this. And it was deeply discomforting at first when he told me that I'm gonna make you do this, um, but I think sometimes you need that push and you need that person to mentor you through um, experiences that you may not have the, the resources or the, the actual experience to actually do yourself. Let's backtrack once again. Yeah. And we will talk all about posts in a minute, mm -hmm. but let's mm -hmm. backtrack once again. What were you doing when you got the call from mm -hmm. Ryan Murphy? Like, What were you doing in your life at that moment? I was just off of my second book tour for um, my second memoir, Surpassing Certainty. So I was finally taking a break. I had like two weeks of vacation. Um, and that's what I was doing is post, I think it was like July 8th. So it was right after, you know, Independence Day, <laughs> a long, nice weekend. And yeah, that's what I was doing. I was kind of like regrouping and trying to figure out what did I want to do next? I just wrote another book. I just promoted that book. Um, I had a fall book tour to, to embark on. Um, and he literally said, leave the world of books and come to the dark side of writing for TV. Right, that's a nice <laughs> That's a nice thing to happen is when you're like, what am I going to do yeah. next? And then the phone rings like, oh, that's what I'm going to do next. But I think Thank a part you. of that was like, I was asking the question. And so something in the universe probably was pushing me toward an answer. And it was just great that someone as prolific as Ryan um, was looking to make sure that he used his access and his privilege and the, the industry credibility that he had built through all of the series that he had done to say that I want to bring in people who've never been given a chance. Not only are actors like Dominic Jack in here who plays Electra, but also folk, you know, behind the scenes, isn't she? She's just, she's like candy. She's literally like candy. It's like, oh, you can't Every line, me. everything is just like, <laughs> I didn't know you could say that that way. That's amazing. <laughs> I know it's, it's, yeah. And so there's so much unmined, you know, untapped talent that are finally taking center stage. And I think that that's one of the most inspiring things about Pose. And it's not just our lead actors, it's also folk who are in our big ballroom productions, those are, that's like 150 to 200 extras yeah. who are dressed to the nines in 1980s height of fashion, who are given a chance to be in front of the camera and to be a part of a production for the first time in their lives. Yeah, and I got, I got that sense when I was in the second or third episode. I think it finally dawned on me as I'm watching like, you know, the mm -hmm. fifth ball scene where I'm just sort of like, look at all of these people getting this chance. Like, mm -hmm. I, I was like, I don't think I've seen a group of extras like this mm -hmm. before. Mm -hmm. I don't think, cause there's no way this is just a group of a regular actors this is a different kind of group of extras, which you don't normally see. You don't, and then you feed it. It feeds the show with the, with an authentic energy that I think it really calls for. Specifically because it is 1980s New York City at a time where there was low to no visibility of um, LGBT people, specifically LGBT people of color. And so for this show 
to be that kind of tool and this platform for these folk to finally have experience to work on a set. Now they can put that on their credit, yeah. that they've worked on a network on a network drama and that they're a part of a production and they can learn and they can see people giving stage direction. They can see people tweaking with lights. And I think that it's probably sparked a lot of light bulbs and people to be like, wow, this is possible, yeah. that I can take center stage or I can work behind the camera. Well, television and movies takes on a completely different life form when you've seen how it's made and the work that goes into it. Because outside of that, it just seems like it kind of exists and you know yeah. you don't see that it's actually part of a big machine that has a lot of jobs in, in, involved in it in so every, many jobs yeah. yeah and like even our crew you know we have um producers and choreographers and consultants um and medical advisors and all kinds of people who are who are trans and lgbt um and in this show has really um and through Ryan's leadership has really pushed forward to make sure that, again, that folks have who have never done this before are now getting experience and are getting credit to be able to, to do this work. Now, when you jump on a show like this, when you get hired for a show like this, what were your first sort of big fears going into it? Not just in terms of your personal fears of you know working on a television show now, but your fears about how it's going to depict the LGBTQ mm. community, historically speaking, in this time period and, and overall. Well, number one, my biggest fear was that I've never been good at group projects, and TV <laughs> is literally just like the biggest group project you can ever think of, from just joining the writer's room. Um, there were four of us in there writing with Ryan, and... It's also a place where you have to be willing to throw away ideas. Yes, like and also be bold enough to say ideas that maybe bad ideas are just shot down by Ryan, who can be real quick about like what he loves. He's very decisive and very specific, so if it's something he doesn't love, you just shot down quick, and then you have to come up with a new idea. So um, you start so that, throwing that it, out ideas that you yeah. might not even like <laughs> that much but you're just like I gotta give him 10 yeah I gotta so. give I gotta give him something yeah. um and so yeah and then I think that in terms of like representation I I think that the reason why I loved this show so much was that I was not brought on um, because we had one trans character. I was brought on because I needed to help feel um, and fuel five trans women's narratives. And so in that sense and the way in which I operate in the world where oftentimes I'm seen as the only representation or one of a few, um, it's great that we can have five trans women who are offering different perspectives on their bodies, on their lives, on sex, on love, on dreams, um, and show different kinds of struggles and, and moments of triumph as well. Right, so it doesn't become a kind of tokenism as well as a kind of like this one person represents all mm -hmm. or this is the only story. Mm -hmm. And so now you can kind of, because of the time period, you can kind of explore the HIV AIDS crisis without it feeling like the only narrative mm -hmm. that consumes this mm -hmm. community and explore other options, other stories as well without feeling like the only narrative that's, that consumes this community. Yeah, and I think the show too, it has such an interesting tone in that way. You bring up, you know, the grit and the, the grim reality of 1980s New York City and what the LGBT community was grappling with with largely with HIV AIDS, but you're also dealing with you know, a quickly changing um, New York City with gentrification and the rise of Trump and finance, greed yeah. and finance, yeah, and all of this stuff. And so like these people, these trans um, and queer people of color are navigating all of that, yet at the same time, they get to go and escape to a world of their own creation, a community in which they build social um, safety nets for one another and families and houses and compete with one another so that when they do win, in that trophy, that little gold or huge for Electra, huge gold trophy um, in a grand prize, the audience knows how much of a win that is for that person. In our pilot episode, for example, you know, um, one of the questions of a show is like, what do you want and who are you? Right, that's one of our central questions. And when Blanca is asked, who's played by MJ Rodriguez, when she's asked, who are you? And she says it, you can't help but to cry and to root for her. Um, and I think that that's what this show does so well and what television, great television does, is that it, it forces you to fill your way through an experience that may be so unlike your own. And so I think that so often with when folk don't, most Americans don't know trans people, so that when they invite Pose into their homes, they're inviting these characters into their homes and now they do know um, trans women, specifically these trans women of color who are just surviving and, and trying to figure out a way to thrive in 1980s New York City. Um, I did not cry when she was asked that. I did cry during the dance number at the end at the studio. And The moment the song comes on, I'm like, oh. oh. Yeah, Whitney. Like, <laughs> 
almost it was almost too mm-hmm. much. I was like, oh, you're gonna get me. Because Whitney on, had now. just started at that time. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So you're thinking about that, and then you're thinking about that time period, and you're thinking about this boy who had just been kicked out of his home, who has just been taken in by this this woman who's a part of this new world he had never heard of, and now she's forcing him and pushing him to achieve his dreams. And these it, victories are just so monumental in that way. It's a really great example, and I hope we're not giving anything away because this is airing on Sunday, but it's a really great example of earning something story-wise because so often in most movies and most TV shows, a scene like that would come up and I'd be like, come on, give me a break. Like I've seen this so many times. But with this, it has been planted and the seed has sort of been planted and the plant has grown so beautifully that by the time you get to this thing that could normally be a cliche, it's really quite beautiful and moving, not to mention the Whitney Houston song yeah. as well. And that's the dance Very musical firm. of it all, right? You know, I think Ryan was really smart in the sense of wanting to frame this show not so much as a drama, but as a dance musical, because that's something that's accessible for people and it's entertaining and there's a certain um, way in which you tell that kind of story through music and through the movement of body. Um, he knew that if it was a series that was just seen as a drama about you know trans women of color in 1980s New York City, most people may not tune in. Yeah. Right, and so in that same way that I think that you know, you got James yeah. Vanderbeek, but you <laughs> we got, got Dawson, James, and, so they yeah. <laughs> and then we got Kate Mara, and right. we have Evan Peters, and then we also have someone who I think is such um, a beloved Broadway talent, Billy Porter, coming into the show and offering another adult. Um, role that really contextualizes and frames um, what this scene means, the ballroom scene means to to these characters. James Vanderbeek really playing a kind of American oh, psycho, right? The greatest, one of the greatest villains that you like hate to love. It's just one of those one of those monumental roles that's just so funny. You're just like, oh, I didn't know that you were like this. You I, know? He's not like that, but watching, I was like, I feel like you've always wanted to play this. There's, I sort of see how much you're relishing this. I know, I know. When he does that interview scene, you, I, I just can't wait till people watch it. He and he does so much more outrageous stuff as you as the series goes on. Oh, I'm, I'm like three episodes in. He's getting weirder <laughs> per, by the episode. Yeah. Uh, so when you go into to direct, what was your first day on set like? I mean, assume they had kind of known you at that point because you're writing yes. the show. and So it's not necessarily like you were a stranger stepping in. Yeah, I wasn't just a guest director. Like a lot of directors just come in and they just do their episode and they leave, right? So for me, my first real day of directing was not glamorous. It was prep. So I went to location scouts. But my first day on set set was the most ambitious days that we have to shoot all the time, which is our ball scenes. Wow. And so I had to shoot... Um, oh, you went into two the fire, full right? days of ball scenes as my first day on as a director. Um, and because I had seen how Ryan had run the set, I kind of modeled myself after how he did it. And because there was a template, because people had already shot ball scenes, I just followed that same template, but with my own spin. And so... All about the B-roll there, right? Yeah, well, it's a lot of B- It's a lot of crane shots, a lot of swooping crane shots, it's a lot of close-ups, it's a lot of, you know, reactions and crowd reactions and really um, trying to get all of the, the extras and the background actors on the same page and to make sure that their energy stays up, not only from, you know, seven in the morning when we start, but also all the way until 3 a.m. Yeah. He loves those crane shots, doesn't he? When I was watching the pilot, I was like, man, nobody in television does crane shots like Ryan Murphy. Nobody else does this. I know he loves a swoop. He loves yeah. the grandiosity of it all, which I think I think it, it lends a sense of like scope to the space um, and movement too, because because it's a dance musical, you have to kind of like go in on the body and go out of the body and go around and to show all of the the whole world that we're trying to trying to portray and 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 paint. Now, one of I think the biggest challenges of directing, and it's an obvious thing to say, but I mean, working with your di- camera department and doing this and doing that, they are all technicians, and they they can kind of as much as it's emotional, they it's very technical. But actors, it's a very emotional process. It's a completely different thing trying to get them to a place that you envision them getting to mm-hmm. without getting in their way or stepping on what they actually have to do to get there. It's a very mystical kind of process, as 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 corny as that sounds. Mm-hmm. I believe that it's a mystical kind of process. It is. You're so, completely right. What was it like for you stepping in there and doing that? Well, what was so great was that um, the Directors Guild of America, the DGA, has a first-time television writers work, I mean, television directors workshop, and so you kind of go into a room with thirteen other people and you sit there all day and you get all this advice from like, you know, location scouts all the way to working to actors to post and editorial. And I learned when you're working with actors, it's best to say the least to keep it very simple, um, to always go in with encouragement as you're giving a note. Um, And my job as a director was to make sure that the scenes were emotionally right. 
um, and that they really told the story that the writer was trying to tell. And what was so easy for me was that I wrote the episode with Ryan. <laughs> and so I knew the story that the writer was trying to tell because I was the writer. And so um, I had an advantage. And I think that most people who don't write the script or haven't helped create the show um, don't necessarily have. So often it's about show me what you have, mm. what you think it's going to mm -hmm. be, and I'll sit, I'll li mostly it's listening, I, I've, I've heard. Yeah, and it's conversation, too. I think that it's, you know, you, you let the actors do what they want in the block rehearsals, and then you kind of move their bodies to places that are most practical for your camera angles. And then from there, you give them a shot to do whatever they want in the first take. We see what works. If it doesn't work, you come in with a note. You know, and then you just keep on refining it and refining it until you both kind of get the collaboration that you want. And you realize that they're not robots and they're not just there to serve your story. They're also people who who, who love these characters because they also helped its creation, not just, you know, because they embody them. Yeah. Uh, let's get some questions from our audience. Who's a question? Right here. Hi. Um, thanks so much for being here. Um, I just recently read Surpassing Uncertainty and it really spoke to me. So I guess my question for you would be, if you could give yourself one piece of advice when, from that moment when you had just moved to New York City and you were in your early 20s, um, what would it be? Oh my God, one piece of advice, that's so tough. Um, I think that I, you know, I, I embarked on writing that book because I wanted to create a love letter to my younger self and to give her confidence. And so I think that a lot of the things that I, um, that I was really trying to say in the book was your story is your own, that no, that no one um, can tell you when you need to tell that story and that what you need to do to survive is what you need to do. And so releasing you know, my younger self from this feeling of guilt and or shame for not being completely open or who needed to make compromises in order to get through the day, that if that's what you needed to do to get through, then that's what you gotta do. Mine is stop drinking so much. No, mine would be drink some more. <laughs> Sleep around some more. <laughs> Have fun now before you get settled down. Yeah. <laughs> uh, next question. Hi. Ooh. Careful. <laughs> being, Hi. Yeah. Uh, being a person who identifies as queer, but also being a person of color, um, I find myself surrounded by people who are trying to come into their own, um, you know, queer identity, but haven't had the support they needed. So I find myself taking that on for them. Mm. How? But I. Uh, Sorry, but I also do that alone, so it's a little bit overwhelming. How do you, um, what advice would you give to someone who wants to help others, but also wants to protect themselves and others, you know, privacy, because it's sometimes it's hard to take on other people's stuff when you can't talk about it with anyone else? Wow. Um, I think that that's where, you know, therapy really helps, <laughs> you know, um, if folk have access to that, right? So, like, thinking about resources, we're lucky to live in New York City, right? So we have a place like Callan Lord where folk can actually figure out ways to get those resources or the center. Um, but I think that that's the, that's the beauty and the power and the strength of community, right, is, like, figuring out ways in which we can support one another in a world where we're often not given that support, but also realizing that it's reciprocal, right? So to be in community doesn't mean that someone just pulls and pulls and pulls from your energy, but that when you need to be able to talk to someone that you can also go to them, right? And so like figuring out ways in which we create those networks with one another to take care of ourselves and to also to realize that sometimes we don't want to talk to anybody, right? And so like having spaces to be alone too is, is necessary in terms of our own self-care. Um, but where you can reach out to, I think that often, for me, I know that what helped largely in my 20s was having a therapist, um, you know, going to therapy really enabled me to have someone who was not connected to my life and who was not invested in that way, that I could just unload and throw everything at this person um, and then find my own takeaways in the process and then go on with my day to then be able to be filled up in order to then, you know, go and listen to someone else's ish. Yeah. Oh, one more. Hi. Um, I'm wondering if you find it more difficult working behind the camera now that you have experience with that based on working in front of the camera. Um, I've never been an actor, so I don't have that experience. <laughs> um, but I think that for me, um, as a as a because I started off in the writer's room and I helped craft the stories that we're telling, it was easier for me to then um, think about ways in which I had conversations with the actors who really were the vessels onto which we told the story. Um, but I think that for me, I had no real interest in being an actor. So then I had a great I had great respect for them for being um, so open and vulnerable. You know, a lot of the storylines that we have on the show have 
have not only been fed through my own experience in the writer's room or my own personal experiences that I brought in the writer's room, but also having conversations with these actors. You know, Dominique's character was a little different, you know, playing Electra. Um, but when we heard her story, she made a shift and adapt and give her a storyline that was so much different than what we, what we thought we were going to give her. Yeah. I want to ask what that storyline is, but I don't want to spoil anything. Well, you're in, you're on episode three, so it I probably just, gets introduced. It just finished three. Yeah. Is it when she's at the doctor's mm -hmm. office? Mm -hmm. Can I say, when she sees the pamphlet <laughs> for the first time, that shot is so funny. <laughs> <laughs> she just, everything she does, she sees it and she goes... <laughs> it's just amazing. Like, you would not expect that reaction She makes from such that. amazing choices, and she's so unique. Um, I just love her. True yeah. original. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, I love the show, Janet. Congratulations. Uh, I really look forward to seeing more of it and seeing your episode as well, which I believe is episode six. Episode six airs in July. Okay, well, maybe they'll put those on the press site soon. I'll get to watch <laughs> them. Uh, but the first episode, which is beautiful, it premieres Sunday night at 9 p.m. on FX. Congratulations. Everybody give a big round of applause for Janet Ma. Thank you so much. Thank you.